that we bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we come now in the name of Jesus asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, and begin reading with the first verse. The book of Revelation, chapter 18, and beginning with verse 1. Uh, several weeks ago, I spoke to you a little about Babylon, and I want to continue looking at that this morning. I mentioned then that Babylon, whatever it is, will affect the economy of the whole world, not just one city. And we can get our eyes fastened on one city and forget that whatever happens in that city is going to affect us. So it's uh, more than just one city, and uh, as a matter of fact, I said I don't even, I want to say beginning, I'm not a student of Revelation. So there's probably others that disagree with me, many would disagree with me, but I'm trusting that there's something in it that will help us. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations. Now I want you to notice this, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath for fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues shall come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off with the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour as thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. And you just see this is affecting the whole world. The merchandise of gold and of silver and precious stone, of pearls and fine linen and purple, silk of scarlet and fine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots, slaves and the souls of men. I'll not read on the rest of that down there uh, in the 20th verse, but we are to rejoice when it happens. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. This city of Babylon had its beginning back in Genesis. In the 10th chapter of Genesis, the 9th verse, we see this man Nimrod who became great on the earth and says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said that even as Nimrod, that mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now, I want you to notice the beginning of Babylon was started with Nimrod. And uh, in the 11th chapter, 
uh, start of the first four verses, and the whole earth was full of one language and one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east and found a plain in the land of Shinar, they dwelt there, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly, and they made, they had brick for stone, and slime had they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city, and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make a let us make us a name. Now I want you to know this is the spirit of Babylon. How many people want to make a name for themselves? Now stick with me. Some way or other, they want to make a name for themselves, just so they'll be recognized in some manner, some way, somehow. I want my name known. Now this is the spirit of Babylon. This started with Nimrod. And it is still running today. Now, as I said, this beginning was started here. Nimrod started it. And we find Babylon running all through the Bible. So the building of the tower that reached the heaven. Now it's interesting that in Genesis, the very next chapter is another city. And that city was started, I mean, not started, but we find Abraham came along and he was looking for a city. Now, I want you to know these two cities running through the Word of God. And you'll see the beginning there in Genesis, you'll see the ending of both of these cities in Revelation. So, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. That's why Abraham, God had him live out this as a demonstration to us. That's why he wasn't interested uh, in any city on earth and just camped out on the hills. He was looking for another city, a city that God built. And uh, so we see the end of Nimrod's city of Babylon and also of Ab Abraham's. We see both of them in the end of Revelation. So we see the end of both cities in the book of Revelation. Babylon is the self in man that does not want to obey God, but wants to make a name for himself. Now in the end of Revelation, you'll notice also then, both cities are personified as a woman. Babylon is personified as a woman. And also the city that Abraham was looking for is also personified as a woman. Now, the holy city in Revelation, the 21st chapter, we find that city is the bride of Christ. This is the city that Abraham was looking for. This is the one he was so excited about, he couldn't get excited about any city on earth because any city on earth is eventually going to be destroyed. Why get excited about something that's going to be destroyed? So, you'll notice in the city of Babylon, uh, it pictures her as a queen, no widow, that she's never been married. She's been an authority, she's in charge, and whatever she's gonna do whatever she wants to do. Mercy. This is the spirit of Babylon. The city of, uh, that Abraham looked for, she, this one is a married woman. She wants a husband. The first one doesn't want a husband. This one wants a husband. And she is the bride of Christ, and she has to submit to her husband, where the queen of Babylon, she doesn't submit to anybody. Well, there's one thing she won't do is submit. Not me. Husbands and wives won't submit to each other. Gracious. How did I get on to that? I said that, that city is still alive. Personified as a woman. Submit to you, not on your life. The, these cities are still alive. So, Babylon, I said a queen. I'm no widow. I've never married anybody. I've never submitted to anybody, and I don't intend to. I'm the one that's in charge. I'm going to make a name for myself. 
And because of this spirit, all the kingdoms, kings of the world and all became rich with this philosophy and this, and this is what the world philosophy and the business world is built on this very same thing. Dog eat dog and I'll down you, I'm going to get rich over you. And all the kings of the earth, they lived in this and they became wealthy, but one day this, this kingdom is going to fall. So the city that Abraham looked for was the bride of Christ. This city is personified as a woman, the city coming down out of heaven as a bride prepared for a bride prepared for her husband. A city prepared for Christ. <laughs> this city is a city that's prepared. That's why God's children have all the troubles they have, all the problems, all the heartache. What God's preparing you for something. You don't get prepared like that in Babylon. That Babylon self is lifted up, self dominates, self rules, self has its way. But this other city is being prepared with problems and trials and difficulty because God is preparing a bride for his son, Jesus. So there's a great deal of difference between these two cities. We could turn to the book of Daniel and we see the city of Babylon there. You remember when Nebuchadnezzar the king saw in a dream a great tree that was was cut down and finally Daniel was called in and Daniel said to the king, oh king, why don't you turn from your sinful ways and maybe God will prolong your tranquility. And, uh, but he refused to do it. And uh, finally at the end of about a year, it says the king spake and said, let's see, the 29th verse of the fourth chapter. And at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? This is not what you see. This is, this is what I have done. Look at what I have done. Look at me. Admire me. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Look at me. Is not this the great Babylon I have built? Is not this what I have done? Look what I have accomplished. Look at me and praise me. Come on now, stick with me, you all. You've heard this and seen this. I'm not preaching anything foreign to you, surely. <laughs> have you not seen it? Surely you have. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built, my power, my power, my majesty? Look what I have done. This is the spirit of Babylon. In Daniel 11:36, it says, The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. This is the spirit that Nimrod started back in Genesis and running all the way through the word of God. Well, some people say that Babylon is a real city or will be. It is a real city. And I'm not a scholar. Although the city doesn't exist right now, some say it's being rebuilt and will be rebuilt. And there will be a city that actually fall. Well, there may be. I'm not uh, going to argue with that. God often used things of the natural world to portray the, portray, portray the spiritual things. So there may be a city. Maybe it's in the building now. Some say it is. And it may be a real city. But I want you to know something. Uh... The spirit of Babylon can get into any church in the world. And you can point your finger and say, that's Babylon, that's Babylon. Some people say, well, it's going to be a certain city. Some people say it's a denomination. Some people say it's a church. You can point your finger any direction you want to, but you'll not keep out the spirit of Babylon out of any church. I don't care where it is, and I don't care how spiritual it appears to be. That spirit can get into any church. It can get into any home. The very spirit of Babylon come, come in between husbands and wives and in churches and that spirit is there while they're pointing the finger at somebody else and say, that's Babylon over there when, when if God really gives a revelation you'll find it's right here. 
So that spirit can be in any church. As I said, some people say it's a city that will be revealed. Some people say it's a denomination. And I'm not here to proclaim either one. Maybe it will be. But Babylon, a city self is built. And there's a coming a day when God will destroy everything man has built. Everything that self has done, I don't care how religious, it will be brought to nothing. It will be destroyed someday. So it's difficult to see that spirit in us, but it's very easy to see it in somebody else. We don't have any trouble seeing the faults and failures of others, now do we? Is there anybody here that has trouble seeing faults in others? Our problem is seeing it in ourselves. But we have a good excuse for what we do, but we, don't, we won't excuse them. How is that? I won't excuse you, but I excuse myself. What a spirit. But Jesus, <laughs> and you no wonder Jesus proclaimed and said, come out of her, my people. What, out of that spirit? Come out of that spirit. My people don't have any, have no right to have that spirit in them. Come out of her, that you not be not partaker of her plagues. If you don't come out of her, you will be partaker of the plagues of that. The plagues that will fall into any home or any church anywhere in the world. The plagues will fall on that group of people. It's no wonder God wants his people out of it. For there's coming a day when that city, that, all that that city has built will be destroyed. It's so hard to see it in ourselves. I heard Dr. Tozer preach a sermon one time on I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now, those are the hardest wounds of any that I know. And even in the religious world, and he was mentioning how that good words have been wounded. You take the word Pentecost, it's been a wounded word. It has come to be equated with tongues. We've had no right to do that. I'm not against the gift of tongues, but we have no right to proclaim, and Pentecost has been come to equate. You talk about Pentecost almost anything, immediately the thing that jumps to our minds is that we equate it with tongues. The word itself has been wounded in the house of the friends. The very people that proclaim it has been wounded there because Pentecost includes the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, everything, all of it. It is not narrowed down to one, and you make a great error to do so. Anyone who does that. I'm not against tongues. The word holiness has been wounded by holiness people. It has come to been equated with dress a great deal. If you're not dressed properly, you're not accepted among holiness people. And the word holiness has been wounded in the house of holiness people. And so if we're not careful, that's, we, we, we can't see the, the things of ourselves, but we see it in others. That's why much of religion will be destroyed when Jesus comes. Much of it, much religion will be destroyed when Jesus comes. Come out of her, my people. No wonder God calls his people out of that, where we can love everybody. And anyone who builds on the spirit of Babylon uh, will not escape the plagues of Babylon. It will come into any church, any home. So the spirit of Babylon. See, the spirit of Babylon is if we don't get our way, we can really get upset. I mean upset. You ever see a Christian ups get upset? He hasn't had the spirit of bad one cast out yet. But there are Christian people who can, good Christian people who can get upset. Isn't that strange? That shouldn't be. And God wants that to come out of her, my people. Be not, let it be not partaker of her plagues. If not, you'll suffer from the plagues of that just as sure as the world. You may want to say, I want my way, but you'll suffer for it. You say, I want my way. Go ahead. Like East County Jones says, you want your way, you have your way, and then you won't like it when you get it. And that certainly is a true saying. See, Jesus taught us that even as a young boy of 12 years of age, he, he said when he 
went back with his his parents, came and got him from the temple, it says he was subject unto them. Uh, Jesus. He became subject to his own parents, and he knew more than they knew. But he became subject to them. Submit. Why is it so hard for us? The spirit of Babylon, God wants it cast out. He wants it out of us. It's going to be destroyed. Everything about us is going to be destroyed. I think I mentioned one sometime before that I saw on a church bulletin board a sign I've never forgotten. It said, the hardest thing to give is in. And I think that's certainly true. The hardest thing to give is in. So in Revelation 19, we are to rejoice over the fall of Babylon. Rejoice when God destroys that spirit among his people. That would be a time for rejoicing if that spirit could be destroyed completely out of, uh, out of our church. I'm not saying that, that I'm pointing at any finger. I'm just saying it's, we're all subject and weak to it. If God could get it out of us, what, what a difference it would make. I'll tell you, it'd be like coming to heaven every time we came here to church. Rejoice in the 19th chapter when God destroys that spirit. Rejoice, why? <laughs> that spirit will be destroyed. Then what happened? Then will be the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And that city, the bride of Christ, will enter into that marriage, the great marriage supper. So we're on our way. Dear ones, all this problem, trial, and cleansing that we're looking for and trying to get a hold, it's because we're on the way to a great marriage supper of the Lamb. That day, why rejoice! God has cleansed his people, and they've made themselves ready for this great marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the city that God wants us to search for and to find, and he wants to cleanse us to be prepared for the great wedding supper of the Lamb. Babylon the queen that does not want a husband, but this one does. This bride wants a husband, a husband to submit to, a husband to surrender to, a husband to obey. So we have two cities. The choice is ours. Do we want it? Will we strive for it? I'm trusting that God will help us to get the spirit, whatever spirit of Babylon may be in any of us, that God will help us to get that spirit out of us and that we'll become the, that be prepared for the bride that God is preparing for his son Jesus.